Tell us more about this grouping. Who's in it? Who's not in it? Well, really, the, the dynamic markets are those uh, countries or those economies that um, are really not um, those mature markets that we've seen before or the established, um, the, the former established uh, markets from the north and the, the west, if you like. So they really all share a common, uh, a common characteristic of, of, of interest in and, and expansive growth. And they really do share a restless energy, if you like, um, from countries and from economies in Africa to those in Asia and Latin America. And we're not just uh, putting them directly into that emerging markets because some of them are e already emerged, like the, the likes of Singapore, South Korea, if you, if you like. And then some of them are less developed, uh, the African economies in particular. Is it useful at all to have these groupings of countries? We talk about BRICS, we talk about CIVETs, um, developed markets, emerging markets, and of course now dynamic markets. Is it useful to have these groupings? Yeah, I, well, I think it is useful. Just uh, for anything, it's, it's, it makes for useful discussion and, and, for use, and also useful uh, comparative um, analyses and assessments. You know, we look at, um, look at Africa, and Africa is often uh, excluded from the emerging markets. And, and now many of the commentators are saying, well, let's, uh, let's look at emerging and developing economies. The dynamic markets uh, indicate that there's far more than just developing prospects for Africa. There's, also, there's a lot of, or there's a number of market opportunities in Africa. What are those market opportunities in Africa? Well, Africa's, uh, in 2011, Africa's going to have a population of about a billion people, half of which are going to be under the age of 35. So there is enormous opportunity in Africa in terms of uh, labor and, and market and market opportunities. So Africa is no longer just um, a, a, a source of natural resources for the other quick growing economies like China and India, but there's enormous market opportunities on offer in Africa. Of course, Africa also has above average global growth rates. Uh, South Africa, though, not uh, having such high growth rates. Are we dynamic enough to be part of this grouping? Uh, that, that's an excellent question, really. South Africa does seem to be the laggard in Africa, which is quite ironic because we are obviously the largest economy, but we are also the, the most sophisticated economy. So South Africa could actually position itself very effectively to be the gateway to Africa to the, for the springboard for new investments. and. Uh, uh, we are dynamic, but that dynamism will depend very much on the, the interface or the interaction, should I say, between, between government and, and business and the policies that come, up, come about to, in, to create an enabling environment for business and investment in South Africa and for the continent at large. And going forward from here, do you think dynamic markets are going to be attracting the lion's share of, of global FDI? Yes, uh, we already seen that. Uh, it, part of the dynamic fold of markets, uh, like we call, as we as we refer to them now at Gibbs, uh, is uh, is China. China is really leading the charge, and they do at, at the moment capture most of that foreign direct investment. And with uh, with other countries um, of the kind of the second tier of, of dynamic markets, gaining quickly on these these countries, especially uh, not only in, in in FDI foreign direct investment, but in other in other areas of international trade and, and pr productivity or production output. As you pointed out, Africa not even usually uh, included in the, the emerging baskets of, of countries, rather called frontier markets in Africa. It does carry risk as well. Uh, first of all, political risk. Yeah. Do you see this as a deterrent to investment? Yeah, but the, the political risk question is, a, is an important one for Africa because perceived political risk and instability is still the number one deterrent of, of investment and foreign direct investment in Africa. But the reality is that it is far better than what it's made out to be in, in media and in just common talk around the, around the globe. Um, I think we need to start projecting a more positive image about Africa, a, a, a more realistic image of the investment prospects. Africa is in 2010 and will be in 2011, uh, the, the best, you will get your best returns on investment in Africa out of any other region in the world. And that just says something about its dynamism as, and as part of that dynamic fold of, of markets. How do we ensure though, that we attract the right sort of investment, that it's not just a resource hungry countries coming to, to Africa to take away our res resources? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yet in the past, we've seen that uh, um, investment has kind of just trickled in and flooded out of Africa. There are ways to actually secure longer term sustainable investment that will ensure economic growth and development across the continent. And that really requires a higher degree of sophistication uh, in, in and among African countries, in the policy makers and, and designing policies that will, that will actually ensure a, a more sustainable investment. So uh, for lack of a better term, a, a higher degree of diplomatic sophistication in negotiating investment, uh, investment flows, investment agreements with some of the big multinational corporations, some of the big countries, uh, realizing that it's not only the Chinese or the United States that will be investing here, but also the Brazilians and the South Africans and the Indians are all coming. What's, what are they looking for when they come to Africa? 
I think they're looking for high returns as anything in business. We're looking for a, a, a bottom line, but we're looking for, uh, or investors are looking for um, long-term stability really. So a predictable environment, an, an, an environment that is going to be less costly than what it's been in Africa. Africa is, is an exceptionally and is still an exceptionally expensive place to do business. We need to bring those costs down. We need to create an enabling environment and one that attracts not just new investment, but reinvestment in the continent. Well, you mentioned uh, Africa will have a billion people uh, from next year, half of those under 30. How big is this emerging consumer in, in, in Africa? Is that what people are trying to tap into at this stage? Yeah, that's uh, half of which will be under 35. So they basically are going to be the next kind of generation, the next, next market generation. And one of the great challenges for Africa is like uh, some of these other dynamic and some of these other big emerging markets, if you like, like China and Brazil, we have to develop a middle class and a thriving middle class. And that will really help us realize the true potential of, of the market opportunities across Africa. Well, apart from Brazil, we also have a lot of other Latin American countries also emerging at this stage. How do we, how do we stay ahead of, the, ahead of them to compete for that uh, investment dollar? I think that's important. Um, a lot of those Latin American countries are also resource rich. They've also got um, interest in if uh, large and expanding markets. Um, and we need to actually uh, compete. We have to realize that we are competing against those, uh, those countries in Latin America and Asia. And to do that, we need to have effective policy making and, and much, uh, a much more focused and, and progressive dialogue between the investors and business and governments across Africa.